So yeah, uh, I'm Dimitri. Yay, the last abundant last uh, talk for today. I hope you still have some amount of energy. That's probably one of the advantages of presenting remotely. I don't see how many of you are actually falling asleep already. Uh, I will definitely do this actually. So yeah. Um, the context is essentially, yeah, we're going to talk about BPF performance and the context is that at the beginning of this year, I took on a very interesting challenge, part of which was trying to understand, try to get visibility into certain BPF applications that were incorporated into one system. Uh, this turns out to be very interesting and the findings were interesting enough, so I decided to share it and see what everybody thinks about this. Uh, and, uh, well, essentially the story goes like this. So normally when we reason about uh, performance of uh, various applications, everything is relatively straightforward from the uh, visibility point of view. So we have our user space application. This user space application relies to a certain degree on some kernel features. And you know, uh, you know that you could profile stuff, both uh, user space and kernel space. You know which metrics are relevant in uh, every situation, which metrics to collect and so on, obviously bearing certain complexity and so on. Uh, but now the thing is that as soon as we try to, as many projects already doing today, as, we, uh, as soon as we try to extend the situation with BPF programs, things are actually getting a little bit more tricky. And for me, it was actually quite interesting when I was starting it sort of like from the scratch that there was no definitive uh, guide how to actually evaluate or how to even reason about BPF programs performance, uh, which probably assumes that there is essentially probably assumes that you could already take existing strategies to do this, which was actually not always the case. Uh, that's why I decided to jump on it and you actually may ask why should we, why do we even have to be bothering about this because BPF, you know, they are extremely small and they have to be, they have to be also pleasantly fast and you would be actually right, but uh, we are talking here about such projects like, for example, security projects like Stackrocks where uh, essentially those BPF programs, they are lying on the hot path of the execution, unfortunately. Uh, which means that even from the many points of view, like even from the strategical point of view, it makes sense to understand what's going on inside because even the smallest overhead is going to be accumulating over the time, obviously. So having this in mind, uh, I wanted to, to, well, essentially I wanted to do two things. First of all, I wanted to collect to some sort of a summary, what is actually common ground? What is the state of thing? state of things and what is important to understand which features are important uh, that are affecting performance of BPF programs. And the second more important question was actually which methods and which approaches could we apply like that we know from the regular performance analysis, which of them and how could we apply to analyze performance of BPF programs. So having those two topics in mind, let's go forward. The first one is the current state of things. Uh, most likely, you know, almost everything out of it is just a summary, uh, which I find from one point of view useful. And at the same time, some of those we're going to use as an example in the future slides. So the examples are, for example, you know, you need to understand that there are various instruction sets and you better be using actually the uh, latest supported on your platform because then uh, essentially layout of your BPF program is going to be as optimal as possible to this point. Uh, and yes, yeah, just essentially going to be smaller and much more efficient. Uh, I'm not going to really you know, spend a lot of time on this because yeah, there are more interesting stuff in the few following slides. But another very interesting stuff and very practical actually, it's a bunch of the operation. So uh, if you know that you are working a lot with uh, BPF maps, if you do workups or the list or whatever, with a lot of elements, you can actually, it just makes sense to batch operations to cut a little bit on the overhead. Uh, especially if you communicate a lot between user and kernel space. Another very interesting example, it's one of those examples where you're actually not looking at, for example, you know, front and bound programs versus back end program and so on. Uh, it's an example where you could optimize using even like an, when you can optimize application algorithmical part of things. So for example, Bloom filters, uh, which is absolutely mind-blowing thing when you can create a probabilistic data structure that will allow you for a certain particular use case optimize things. Uh, it's essentially a probabilistic data structure like a, well, it's a BPF map that is a probabilistic data structure under the hood that allows you to figure out if some particular element is not present in the map extremely efficiently. And another one which we are going to talk about a little bit later is, uh, and, and this feature I'm pretty excited about actually, it's a program back allocator, which essentially tries to do a very simple thing. 
it tries to uh, pack all the small programs, BPF programs together on a either normal or huge page so that it will be essentially hitting less. It will produce less instruction TLB pressure, but uh, there's a little bit more to it in a sense like in a consumption way, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. And another one is, which is also very exciting and interesting is, for example, when you know that your BPF program is actually hitting quite often, for example, memory, uh, memory uh, misses or something like that, like cache misses, you know that you always have on the table task local storage, where you essentially could put some bits of uh, whatever you're working with closer, uh, like in the memory, in the RF memory closer to the actual task you're working with. So those are essentially like a short summary, extremely short summary of what you probably may need to look at when you're developing something new to get actually, you know, to squeeze out some extra performance, some extra efficiency out of already efficient implementation. So now let's talk a little bit something more interesting. So which methods that we already know about, which of the normal performance analysis methods could be applied in terms of PPF? So the first one, and it's actually very interesting, even before running everything, we could already start thinking about this stuff. Uh, we can actually start talking to the compiler. Normally, uh, pretty much all the major compilers can provide some amount of uh, performance optimization reports that they were able to produce and performance optimization that we're not uh, able to take. So the opportunities that were actually missing on the table. And uh, fortunately for us, we could do the very same thing with BPF. So, uh, LLVM for um, CLAN compiler has some amount of such options, a couple of them are on the slides. And another very interesting practical thing I found when I was uh, trying to get this report anal analysis for our particular probes that we were working with was that I actually, um, fast, the vast majority of such not taking opportunities were about not eliminating some particular loads. So essentially global value numbering uh, paths were complaining about this quite often. And it turns out, well, to my understanding, it happens because BPF programs are quite often working with this, you know, with this opaque uh, uh, pointers, like, for example, context or something where essentially a compiler doesn't have enough information about what is actually behind this pointer. And essentially, this uh, not taking optimization means that a uh, compiler thinks that there is possibly some, some opportunity to take, but a uh, compiler doesn't have enough information to actually do this step because maybe the validity of the program or the program is going to be uh, compromised in this case. A very interesting situation and even more interesting to see that some of those not taking opportunities I was able to eliminate in our particular case by just playing around with the restrict keyword which is a very simple thing. It's just a keyword that allows you to let, uh, to, give you, to give more information to the compiler. It essentially says that there are no overlapping pointers that are going to be overlapping with this particular one. So uh, essentially you can say that there is no memory, that there are no pointers either uh, derived from this one or directly this one could be updated from the outside, which sometimes makes sense. And just even uh, such a simple example like this already was able to eliminate some amount of those not taking opportunities. So now let's go a little bit further and now we're already running some stuff. Uh, the first very simple thing when we try to analyze performance is actually to get some global statistics. So for example, you know, uptime or lower diverges or something like that. So for BPF, we could actually do something similar. So we could uh, essentially check out the global statistics that kernel collects for us when we enable this actually. So for whatever reason, it's not always enabled uh, as far as I as far as I understand, uh, but this is a very, it's not very detailed information, but at the same time, it's very simple to get it. And at the same time, it's provides you some sort of like really interesting and simple ballpark numbers for, you know, for doing, for example, sanity checks for other methods, more advanced methods. Another also sort of hilarious approach that it's still, I decided to put it on the slide because people are still doing this and it's pretty much visible everywhere. You could literally modify your BPF programs to actually like, you know, print out something on the, using printtk, which is of course not efficient and you're going to do a lot of overhead, so it's not feasible when you have a lot of events, but still sometimes very simple approach, very flexible, so why not? Now we're coming to something more interesting. So um, one of the very powerful performance analysis approach is a top-down analysis. I'm not sure if you, if everybody aware about this, so I'll try to summarize it in a couple of words. It's actually a huge topic on its own, uh, but essentially it's about collecting some hardware counters of 
while executing their programs, some certain hardware counters to try to uh, understand where exactly bottleneck lies in your program. And you try to categorize those events in the certain categories. You know, for example, you can say that your program on the first level of top down, you can say that your program is front and bound mostly, or back and bound, or like, for example, there's a branch mess prediction, or essentially maybe it could be that uh, almost everything is actually retired micro operations, which is fine. And then on the first level, you're going deeper. That's why it's called top down. And then you're going deeper and you're figuring out, okay, maybe our problem is back and bound, maybe ESB cache is not used efficiently, and so on and so forth. So a very powerful approach because it uh, gives you some sort of a systematical approach to things. Uh, could we apply the very same uh, method for BPF in case of BPF programs? It turns out to be yes. And for that, essentially, so in theory, just abstractly, we could actually do this uh, thing just using a factory affected programs. So we create uh, just like instrumentational eventually affects a program for whatever counters we want to collect. And then we attach them and essentially doing this snapshot at the beginning of the PPF program and at the end, and then compare whatever we want. Uh, that was pretty much uh, interesting to realize, especially since uh, everything's already there, you know, so perfstat could essentially provide you this amount of event filter by some particular BPF program, and it already has first level of top-down method uh, implemented in it. So I was pretty much excited about it, but unfortunately, I'm not sure why, but for whatever reason, I didn't manage to make it work. I was tracing it down to the point that essentially all the counters that I was creating, they were always zero and not a single event was counted. So I was completely confused about this. Maybe something was wrong about my setup. So what I have done eventually, I just extended BPF to profile uh, command with subset of those top-down events taken from perf. And actually this thing worked, was working. So in theory, it's possible to collect and to apply this approach, which is very, very great news for us. So yeah, about perf, if you know about this topic better, let me know. Maybe there are some particular things that I have missed. So why it's so important that we could actually apply this approach? Let's jump a little bit back and talk a bit about program pack allocator. So uh, I'm not sure how exactly Fox came up with this idea that there is, for example, on some particular system and there is a lot of uh, instruction will be uh, pressure on it, but using a uh, top-down approach, you can actually try to figure this out without you know, having a huge amount of uh, practical experience or without some hunch, you just uh, could do this in a more methodical way. So what I'm talking about here is essentially when you see that, uh, well, instruction to be uh, pressure usually uh, usually represents itself uh, when your program is quite front and bound. So it's one of the contributing factors. And in generally front and bound programs, it could happen that the programs could be uh, like that. Uh, it's all about layout of your program. So. We often, for example, talk that layout of BPF program has to be optimal, so it, you know, it has to be small, uh, it has to be aligned, this has to be like the hot path has to be in a, implemented in a fall-through way, so all this stuff usually handled for us by the compiler, it's uh, pretty much simple in this regard, but what program pack, uh, pack allocator takes is it takes this idea a little bit further, it tries to optimize this layout across the serial BPF programs, which I find very interesting. and. Uh, having this approach, so the top-down approach, you can actually take it one step further. So the thing is that uh, quite often BPF projects that are used, for example, at least our that we're using from Falco libraries, they are using, they essentially notice there's not a single BPF program that is being responding to some particular events, but rather a cold chain of several BPF programs connected via tile calls. Which means that at the end of the day, when we're talking about layout of the program, we're not talking about a single program. We're talking about layout of this whole chain, which makes it actually a little bit more complicated. And packing them together makes things a little bit already more efficient, but we could take this idea even more further. So uh, let's imagine we have uh, something like this. So we have a couple of memory pages where we pack those programs together. But now imagine that since they are essentially responding to different events and there is this different complication chain of flow, some of them could be cold programs and some of them could be hot programs. So they are getting executed more frequently. And it just happened that just because of the order in which programs in which uh, those programs were loaded, it could happen that uh, a couple of hot programs were loaded on the first page together 
with the cold program and the same mix and match happened on the second page, which obviously probably not that efficient in packing in the regard that uh, you have to take more pages actually to, um, to respond to most of the workload. What's, what's interesting is that those PPF programs are actually even small enough so that even like a cache line instruction, cache line size could matter in the sense that if I recall correctly, PPF program are located uh, with an alignment that's slightly lower than that. So essentially all those boundaries when they're stepped over with uh, in the regard of hot and the cold program, they could play a little bit of an overhead and at the end of the day make your whole cold chain a little bit more front and bound. So I find it a very fascinating idea and again, uh, top-down can allow you to think about this in a little bit more systematic way. So now let's continue. Usually when we already got some uh, insights that we have uh, acquired from the top-down approach, we know for example that we have for example backend bound program because there are some cache misses or something. Uh, usually what follows is that we have to profile our application to understand where is this coming from actually. So where are those hotspots of those events happening and how can we modify our code to actually improve the situation. So the question is again, could we do similar stuff with BPF programs or not? The answer is fortunately yes for us, but there are a couple of like, you know, caveats that we're probably going to discuss now. So what you could see on the slide is an example of such profiling when I was collecting micro operations retired stalled, um, which is a, essentially uh, an event that says that during this particular cycle, not a single micro operation was delivered. And uh, fortunately, this particular BPF program was compiled with PTF, which is just essentially like a, the best possible situation for us because now we could actually not only read this output of profile, we could also correlate it with an actual C implementation which makes things much, much easier. And here we could see that uh, quite a lot of those samples, well, just to make it clear, there were not that many samples, it was just a test, uh, essentially test run, but most of those, well, quite a lot of those samples were actually uh, hotspotting around a helper BPF ring buffer reserve, which probably tell us that we need to look at this deeper and see what's going on there. Maybe, maybe it's not really necessary, maybe we can get rid of it, or maybe we replace it with something and so on and so forth. Uh, but one very annoying thing that I find about this is that I haven't actually found any single way how to uh, do this in a more isolated way. So the thing is that when we profile normally our applications, everything is clear. So you just profile this particular thing or this particular process. And guess with BPF, they are essentially, essentially they're extending the kernel to a certain degree. And since, uh, well, the event could be triggered from pretty much everywhere, at the end of the day, especially on the production systems, you have to profile everything. You could try to minimize this load, you know, by capturing on the kernel stack traces or by like trying to reduce it to some particular cores in your machines, but still at the end of the day you're going to get a lot of unrelevant events, which is quite annoying. So I was thinking, uh, how could we actually feel that there's out? And I was actually suddenly I was pretty excited when I have realized that I could use InterPT feature which is essentially like a sort of a hard way of filtering out some particular stacks that I'm interested in. Uh, and it works pretty nicely in many, many situations. So you can actually profile some certain syscalls if you're interested with that and so on and so forth to get on get this batch of information. Uh, but my excitement, well, went out quite quickly because uh, it was the second part that I actually didn't manage to make work properly, unfortunately. Uh, if you already know something about this, again, let me know. But what happened is that uh, this particular incantation, when we say, please uh, record some events, but please filter them out using Intel PT for this particular BPF program, this uh, essentially fails with an operation not supported, which is interesting because I haven't, find any, I haven't found any mention of not supporting this feature for BPF uh, uh, programs except in the context of virtual machines. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure maybe it's deeper than that, but nevertheless, that was a little bit disappointing. So now one of the probably, well, in this context, the last one, but a very, very exciting approach to uh, performance analysis modeling. So what is it all about? Essentially, when you, uh, essentially what you're doing here is you're trying to create a simulation program. You're not trying to benchmark something or something from this sort, you just create a simulation program that represents to some certain degree that captures the basic feature of your application. And then you run this simulation and see how, which insights you can collect from it. And I'm mentioning it here because I'm completely convinced that it's actually very important to do this in case, especially in case of BPF, because overall the system is extremely complicated. 
So uh, you can see that there are a lot of like different options to choose, a lot of different maps, a lot of different configurations, you know, memory locations. Uh, there could be some cores involved, like intercourse communication. Uh, and at the end of the day, this whole system uh, it turns out to be a complex system, not in the sense that it's uh, like an intrication of some sort and so on, but in a scientific sense. So the output of our system depends on the input, unfortunately, not linear. At the end of the day, it means that when we uh, try to reason about these models in a more like, you know, intuitive way, our results could be quite often not, not correct because there could be some counterintuitive situations, especially in the case of like, you know, there are some edge cases and so on. That's why it's very important to try to build such models and see what insights are they provided. So an example uh, that I did for this particular talk, I did, I took a run key slower from the kernel uh, set, from the kernel project, from the repository, and especially I was concentrating myself on this particular commit when run key slower was switched from the uh, normal hash maps to task local storage, which was very interesting to see what would be the difference actually. Uh, I was actually not modeling it directly. I was modeling essentially the only one particular difference. I was leaving latency the same, but you know when uh, cash, uh, when hash maps are growing, they're usually getting less efficient. That's a very known fact. And uh, task local storage in this regard is supposed to be a little bit more constant. So that was the only difference that I have encoded in my modeling, my simulation application. Uh, and then at the end of the day, what it was like essentially a state machine uh, where every state was corresponding to a certain process state, like, you know, it's been waiting on the queue or it's been executing or it's been decued. And there were a couple of extra situations around DPF programs that are uh, instrumenting queue and waiting time. And here is a small result out of it. Again, the program was extremely simple. It was captured only basics, so like, you know, contention on the course, num number of CPUs, or like, which exactly, uh, like, is it a hash map or task local storage and so on. And what happens here is that we have by x-axis, we have number of processes executing in our uh, simulated system. And here we could see an overhead in a process, uh, overhead in a sense, how much time we spend doing DPF bookkeeping versus how much time we spend actually executing processes. And you can see that the amount of time we're doing, we have, the amount of overhead we have at the beginning is very negligible. But yeah, as soon as we get into the hundreds and thousands of processes, this simulated system is getting overwhelmed. And what's more interesting to see that even with this small difference that I have implemented in the application, task local storage is still much more well, visibly more performant than its hash map counterpart. So this is very interesting and very uh, exciting way to try to also get uh, some understanding and try to get insights into your applications. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I actually didn't uh, talk about some other approaches because of you know, partial lack of time, partially because I still haven't tried them out yet in practice. But nevertheless, I hope that now you get better, and, or at least you get better, or even maybe potentially new perspective, how to look at your BPF programs, and hopefully you can apply this in the field. And I hope there are some questions in the audience. Any questions? Anyone? Oh, hello. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I haven't, um, I don't think you've, uh, well, it wasn't clear to me uh, whether you've looked at the BPF tool uh, profile feature that uh, can profile particular BPF program with a set of BPF programs and extract uh, like counters. Like yeah, of course. Cache yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. Absolutely. So that was one of the parts I didn't put it into a slide because it was sort of obvious because you can find it in pretty much every manual. Uh, uh, and from to my understanding, I mean, I'm not sure what is the common consensus here, but to my understanding, people are trying to keep BPF tool a little bit like, not free of the unnecessary stuff uh, so that for example top-down approach ideas is not going to land there at all especially since it's implemented in Perl. so that's why i like, don't put it into slide directly but yeah that's one of the things that i was using quite often uh, during this whole investigation process cool thanks and yeah, one thing that i haven't seen uh and maybe you, you you can tell more this restricted pointer uh, is it about like pointer aliasing, right? Uh, is is it really? 
Is it is it really doing something, or uh, I guess compiler can in most cases figure it out? Uh, yeah, in most cases, compiler is actually good enough indeed. Uh, the only reason why I started to look at this was that uh, when I compiled a relatively simple set of props or those Falco libraries, I got literally 6,000 of complainings from the compiler that some loads were not able to eliminate. Uh, that compiler was not el eliminated to uh, those loads. And uh, to be honest, not all of them are actually handled by this restricted keyboard, only like a couple of hundreds probably. So it's a like, small fraction of those, but still in some certain case, it just makes sense to provide more information to the compiler. Compiler is definitely quite, has a lot of like, you know, its compilers are quite smart, but uh, still there are edge cases when some information, some extra information could help. Interesting. I want to sprinkle some of them in our programs and see what happens. Yeah, I think. Out. I'm not saying that it's going to be like extremely yeah. helpful, but again, yeah, just enable those uh, optimization reports, pro, uh, of reports and see what will be the result. Yeah, so it wasn't clear to me, like, when you added restrict, like, what actually improved? Like, what are we improving here? Oh, yeah, sorry. So, I probably wasn't clear about this. So, what is what was improving is that compiler was able to do its job aggressively, more aggressively, and some duplicated load. So, essentially, the memory or, like, the values that are getting loaded or some registry that are getting probably duplicated and they could be deduced from before that, those, uh, those loads were eliminated and essentially at the end of the day it means that your program is getting a little bit less uh, back and bounded because there are just simply less loads. Basically, so it doesn't, re it eliminated some unnecessary reads of the context fields. Exactly. Is that right? Exactly. Okay. Any other questions? So earlier you mentioned that you dumped uh, some of the LLVM optimization passes to figure out what was missed. Uh, did you try this also on more complex applications? And if so, what did you find specifically that for optimization? Yeah, so uh, in fact, uh, I was trying it on the most complex stuff that I was having, essentially on this video side of things, which is sort of a derived, which is a fork from the Falco libraries. And its complication uh, comes from, yeah, from this graph approach. So it's just a bunch of various BPF programs connected together by themselves. They're not really complicated. They're not really big. They're just, you know, collecting some information and storing it somewhere. So that was the top complication I was able to get my hands on. Uh, so probably if you have some different type of PPF programs, maybe you'll get something different. But as I said before, uh, the most of the, like literally a vast majority of reports were about those missed opportunities about the duplicated loads. There were a couple of more reports. I actually don't remember exactly what was it about, but they were, well, maybe a couple of hundreds of extra reports of some other types. So they were not really catching my attention in this regard. Uh, also, like, I probably missed it as well, but uh, you had this slide where you said you, you use like parf dash dash top down. I'm first time seeing that. Like, what is that? Can you explain what, what that does? Like, maybe you have an example output of that or something. So you said like you didn't, you couldn't make it work, right? But like, what do you expect it to get? So let me, let me, let me display. I couldn't make it work for BPF case. Normally, of course, it works. So, uh, this yeah, so the question is like when it works, right? Like for normal applications or kernel, I don't know. What, what do you get with top down? So, what do you get is a very nice output where essentially you see that uh, you see a report that during this execution, we have collected this and that many events, and out of those events, we are managing yeah, to manage it as your program yes. is, for example, 30% front end bound. What does it mean? You have to check it out. Uh, the definition of those functional bound events that are like falling into this category, and then you have to start profiling for those events to see where they're coming from. Or you see that, for example, you see the program is back and bound 60% of the time, and then you have to think about memory management for your program. So you essentially see in which category your program is falling just based on those events. Uh, and then uh, yeah. stepping on the second level, so unfortunately Perf does not support the second or anything uh, below first level, so stepping down with, for example, other tools that support this, you can go to the second level, third level, up to, I believe there are six of them or so, and you can narrow down this point, what is exactly bottleneck in your application. So that's essentially the output of this, uh, of this tool. Okay. I, I never knew about this. Probably should try it. So like Perf basically tries to help you understand like where your bottleneck is. 
Exactly. Okay. So exactly. No, normally you have to get some sort of experience. You know, normally you need to understand what's going on, or maybe like a hunch. Aha, my application is probably has a lot of TLB misses or something. Uh, and in this regard, Perthos tries to help you in this regard to like replace this hunch part. All right. Cool. Any other comments, questions? Well, I guess this is it. Thank you very much for the for the presentation and uh, we'll be wrapping up for today.